In the 1960s, Stan Lee was trying to come up with new superheroes for Marvel Comics. He wanted new powers that hadn't been done before, and found inspiration from a spider that he saw crawling on a wall. And just like that, he had his new character, a hero with the power to stick to walls. Spider-Man. Now, whether or not you believe that story, which Stan himself even implies is probably not true, the point is that clinging to walls is a defining characteristic of Spider-Man. But a recent scientific study has shown that it would be impossible for the old wall crawler to actually crawl walls. And I want to know how true that is. What's this? Another Spider-Man video? I know, I know, the channel is starting to look a little spider heavy as of late. If you follow me on Snapchat, you know that I was planning on making a cyborg video this week, but since the spider science has been sweeping the internet, I couldn't resist digging in myself. Plus, you guys voted on Twitter, so look, I mean, I don't have to explain myself. This is my show. We're gonna talk about Spider-Man. As I said, making its way around the internet very recently was a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that disproved Spider-Man's ability to cling to walls. Two interesting things about this study. Number one, it was actually published in December of 2015, but for some reason, the entire internet decided to talk about it all at once over a month later. Number two, nowhere in this study does it actually mention Spider-Man at all. Seriously, go read it, or at the very least, control F that thing for Spider-Man. It is nowhere. And as a comics fan, that makes me really, really happy that we as a culture seem to instinctively relate new scientific studies with superheroes. I love this time. We live in a great time. Anyway, the study is called Extreme Positive Allometry of Animal Adhesive Pads and the Size Limits of Adhesion-Based Climbing, and I can sense that you're already wanting to click away from the video, but I promise, super interesting stuff. Before we get into the study, we should take a look at the comics to see how they explain Spider-Man's clinging ability. How exactly does the wall crawler crawl walls? in the first place. We get our answer in the form of several entries in several editions of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. It's stated quite clearly, although not exactly confidently, that Spider-Man, quote, apparently has the ability to mentally control the flux of interatomic interaction between molecular boundary layers. This ability to affect the attraction between surfaces is limited to Spider-Man's body, especially concentrated in his hands and feet, and another object with an upper limit of several tons per finger. Okay, so that sounded like a bunch of weird nonsense, but is there any truth behind the science of this explanation? Actually, yeah. The way that animals like spiders or even geckos stick to walls is thanks to tiny hair-like structures called setae, which are tipped with hundreds of even smaller structures called spatulae. You might notice that these kind of look similar to what the 2002 Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie showed growing out of Peter Parker's hand, so... Good job, movies. These microscopic projections are key because they exploit a phenomenon in physics known as intermolecular forces, sometimes under the catch-all term of van der Waals forces. Van der Waals to stand on walls, yeah, sort of. Picture a molecule that has electrons zipping around unpredictably. We like to imagine that these electrons line up in a nice structured pattern, but it's really a lot more chaotic than that. Statistically, there are way more configurations where the electrons are out of order than in order. Sometimes you'll have the molecule's electrons all grouped to one side of the atom, which gives that side a slight negative charge and the opposite side a slight positive charge. If you introduce another molecule, which just so happens to have its electron structure in a similar fashion, the two will be attracted towards one another via one molecule's slightly positive charged side and the other's slightly negatively charged side. The setae in a gecko's toes or Pete's hands have fluctuating electrons, and if those tiny hairs become slightly negatively charged for even just a moment, they repel the electrons in the molecules of the wall, since like charges repel each other, and create a slight positive charge in the wall. Opposite charges attract, so an attractive force is created between Spidey and the wall. This is what I believe the Marvel Handbook meant by Spider-Man having the ability to control the flux of interatomic forces between molecules. You might be wondering how this power could work through his costume. Spider-Man wears a full bodysuit. That would totally get in the way, right? As far as I know, this has never been fully explained in the comics, but we do know it's one of the main reasons why Spider-Man wears a thin, skin-tight spandex costume. When Steve Ditko was designing the character's costume, he remarked how a clinging power wouldn't work if he 
gave Spider-Man hard, thick shoes or boots. The suit had to be something form-fitting and thin enough to allow for this ability to work through his costume. And that's why there have been times when Pete has had to take off his shoes to use his wall crawling ability when he's wearing civilian clothes. I know the Marvel Handbook explanation says that each of Spider-Man's fingertips can support several tons each, but... Vanderwall's forces are so weak that Spider-Man would need billions upon billions of these tiny hairs all over his body for that force to add up and support his weight. And that's where this recent study comes into play. Researchers examined 225 different species of climbing animals from amphibians, insects, lizards, and of course spiders to observe the limits of their climbing abilities in correlation with body size. As you might expect, creatures with a smaller body mass only need a tiny percentage of their surface area to be covered in adhesive pads in order to support their own weight when climbing. You can see in this handy scale that ants on average need about 0.09% of their body's surface area to be covered in sticky foot pads, spiders need a bit more at just under 1%, geckos need about 4.3%, and humans would need a whopping 40% of our total body surface, or about 80% of just the front of us to be covered by adhesive pads. According to one of the senior authors of the study, Walter Federal, if humans wanted to climb walls like a gecko, quote, we'd need impractically large sticky feet and shoes in European size 145 or US size 114. Just for comparison, the Guinness Book of World Records recognizes this man as the record holder for the biggest feet and his shoes are still just size 26. So that's it. We can all give up on our dreams of being Spider-Man because science says it's impossible. We'll never be able to scale tall New York skyscrapers. Not that I would want to, it sounds terrifying. I have a very prominent fear of cities. But hold on, if saying that Spidey would need 40 to 80% of his body covered in those microscopic hairs to stick to a surface seems a bit overkill, that's because the researchers were basing it off of naturally occurring setae in animals like the gecko. And sure, making the surface area bigger to accommodate for bigger animals like us humans is certainly one solution, but another would be to instead make Spider-Man clingier. Thankfully, ingenious scientists at Stanford University's Department of Mechanical Engineering have created something even better than gecko toes. You can see a video of it here. They are hand grips with a connected foot support that allows for us large, awkward, clunky humans to overcome gravity and scale buildings. And I do mean just buildings. These pads work best on smooth surfaces like glass, but don't work great on uneven surfaces that you might find out in nature. But that's fine. Spider-Man is all about the city. So as long as I can still climb skyscrapers wearing a Spider-Man onesie, then I'd call this a victory for science. What do you guys think? How does Spider-Man's wall clinging power work? And is it ever something that we could effectively achieve either through tiny organic hairs like Spider-Man or through technology? Let's talk about it all in the comments. And if you wanna learn more about Spider-Man's powers and abilities, click right here to learn about the history of his web shooters, both organic webbing and mechanical devices. I make a really insensitive Gwen Stacy joke in it, so click right here to check it out. And if you want more comic book science, why not check out this video on Deadpool Deadpool's healing factor. The movie is coming up, so impress your friends with this fun comic book theory about how Deadpool's cancer might actually be a beneficial mutation. Click here to watch that one. And make sure you hit that big sexy subscribe button so you don't miss out on all the new videos we make for you every week that explore the history, science, art, and philosophy behind your favorite comic book superheroes. My name is Scott, and I will see you right here on Friday for another video. See ya.